Um, so uh, we have Christine, we have Ellie, we have Neil, and we have Will. We're going to ask each of them a little bit about how they got started, and then we'll show a show reel for each, just so you can contextualize them and see where they come from. So, Christine, may I start with you? Hello, I'm Christine Mackay from Salamandra, UK. And um, I come to animation on a slightly different tangent because uh, we do B2B animation, so more commercial rather than... It's still storytelling, but it's a kind of a different perspective. And I fell in love with animation a, a few years back where I find it's just an incredible platform to convey complex messages on so many uh, possibilities of, of doing so um, and really useful way to get uh, messages across for business. So ha that's how we started into animation. Okay, so shall we show your showreel, please? Sorry, the 12 of us all together, and we've got a branch in Eton and another branch in Dundee. Oh, okay. Right, Ellie, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started. Hello, is this on? Yes. Hi, I'm Ellie. Um, I'm only about three and a half years out of uni, um, but I'm from Nerd Productions London, um, and I also am a technician tutor at the UCA, uh, University for the Creative Arts, and um, my show will, will reflect um, my journey a little bit. It's a little bit of everything. It's commercial stuff. It's short film. It's um, social media content. It's c um, like branded content. I've kind of wanted to dabble in as much as I can before I kind of commit to a, a single path. Um, so you'll see that. Great. So thank you. And now shall we move on to you, Neil? Hello. Tell us a little bit about how you got started, and then we'll look at your showreel. Um, well, 15 years ago, we were just wrapping up a master's in animation, and our lecturer came up to myself and a friend and said, do you want to do an animation for a friend of mine? He had an idea for a kid's show pilot. So we said yes. Uh, and that was basically the birth of Seed. Um, 15 years later, we're still sort of chipping away, doing our thing. Um, initially, we were a full CG studio, and now we've kind of diversified into pretty much every medium going out there and mixing it all up. Um, so, yeah. All right, let's have a look then, shall we?
So, Will, uh, tell us where you started, how you started, and we can have a look at yours. Uh, hello, my name is Will, and uh, I'm now an animation director at Blue Zoo. And I started off as a student at the University of Hertfordshire, did three years there, and then I managed to leave the university with, with a job. Uh, and I was really fortunate to get that. Uh, the job was at Blue Zoo, and I've been there now nearly nine and a half years. And uh, the job that I got was one of the worst jobs you could ever imagine. But it didn't matter, because I was there, and I was going to make it work, and I was going to work my way up to where I am now. And the showreel you're about to see now is from about four years ago, because I haven't animated properly in like four years. So this is from the past. <laughs> Thank you. Understand. You should see some of the things I've baked that came out, well, different than expected. Yes! Let's create the greatest list ever! Yikes! Um. Now how about some brownies that turn blue? Why, thank you. Some of my goodies may have unexpected qualities, but I never see any of them as mistakes. More like masterpieces in disguise. I better get going. I promised a lot of folks that I'd bring them some of my fresh baked blueies. I wish I could paint a flower as well as you bake a bluey. I need more paper, more pens, Ooh, something to list. Stay up, stay up. Listen to your heart. Thanks, Will. That's great. <laughs> well, well, I feel I have to come straight back to you, really, because oh, you really? talk okay. about, uh, <laughs> you told us the university you came from, and then you said you had the absolute worst job, yeah. and then you've got to a stage now where you don't do any animation at all. Uh, so yeah. could you perhaps explain <laughs> some of that? <laughs> Living the dream. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, any graduate straight out of university is going to probably not have the greatest role at the very beginning and mine was um so there's a tv series called tree free tom and the main character tree free tom had a little skirt and my job was to go in every scene and make sure that skirt didn't go through his legs on 26 episodes they were 20 minutes long yeah it wasn't great but um I, it was my opportunity and there were like shots going around that i was like oh, i'll do that one oh i'll do that one i'll do that one and i proved the the director that i could do it he then promoted me to animator on the next show and then so on and so forth. So I was a lead animator, I was a lead animator for a few years, and now I am animation director on my fifth, fourth or fifth project, I don't know. So uh, it's, it's just proving yourself that you can do it, and um, just keep trying to be better. And so for clarification then, the animation director uh, uh, just tells other people what to do and doesn't do anything? Uh, it's, it's more to it than that. Um, well, it, it's, it's like <laughs> to explain that role. <laughs> okay, so an animation director, um, is pretty much responsible for anything that moves. So you have to make sure that the, the quality of any of the characters' movements is pretty good. But you're also re responsible for overseeing uh, every episode as well to making sure it's the best it can be in terms of acting choices, uh, in terms of the posing. Uh, also, you, you kind of have to be a bit of like, uh, sort of like a big brother to the artists as well, making sure that they're okay, making sure everyone's well, making sure everyone's motivated. Um, and then also, yeah, you do give out feedback and you have to be good at giving out feedback and also taking feedback as well. Uh, yeah, I, I don't just sit and do nothing and tell people what to do. I, there's a lot more. <laughs> and I do help out when I need to as well because I can and I try to be as helpful as possible. No, I just thought it would be good to clarify. <laughs> okay, good. <yeah. laughs> so coming back to you, Christine, you are in that role yourself then, are you, that you are overseeing a, a company and uh, guiding young talent through, yes? Um, in a way, yes, but we've also got um, an animation director and yes. an art director, so they tend to do a lot of what um, Will does. Um, yeah. for my role is more on a commercial side, but also making sure everyone's okay as well and motivated and uh, ha have the same core values and passion for the business. 
Uh, but being a small company, it's quite different where somebody will join us and can grow and change jobs quite quickly. We had, for example, a graphic designer who joined us who's now a very good 3D um, animator. Wow. Uh, she told me at the beginning, I said, what do you want to do? What's your dream job? Uh, and I ask all, all my guys that. And then I try and give them the opportunities to go towards what their dream is. To, to let them have you know have that opportunity. In fact, we had um, a, a young chap who came to do some work experience with us, and he nabbed a job at Disney after that. And he s he said it was thanks to us. How cool is that? Yeah. S so <laughs> that the more you look after them, the more likely they are to, to leave you. Could well, that in in a sense, it's, it's like um, uh, Dave Branson said. Uh, Richard Branson said that uh, you're supposed to uh, take care of people and, and train them up. So that enable them to leave and then treat them in a way that they don't want to. So that's a kind of one of our mottos too. Yes, that's good. And and, and in fact, I remember at, at the BBC, they said, you know, you've, you've got to be careful. People are worried sometimes about training people because then they might move on and leave. And that's it. But what is the alternative? You don't train them and they're not very good and they stay. You know, so well, I think I think if you keep learning, you never get bored because uh, you're yes. always learning new things. I think it just keeps sparks your imagination, and your creativity, and I think that that helps you to stay, you know, uh, engaged. Yeah. So, so you're in a role overseeing and a, a lot of the commercial side as well, and we will come to that as well. But I want to contrast that with what you're now, with the position that you're in, because you're mainly freelance, are you? Although you do do, s or you are working for a company at the moment. Yeah, so the I think my role of animation director, like the definition probably varies quite a lot from yours, because um, it is, Nerd Productions is more of a, a representation-based um, company, so when the briefs come through, then they'll approach me, so it's not like I go in every day. Um, but th yeah, the projects that I do direct on, I also animate on, and I work on a lot more, um, is I guess, tighter um, production, but so could you t explain to me then uh, a, a, a typical day for you then? Um, well, I've already, if I'm freelancing, hopefully had this day planned for at least two weeks before um, yeah. and solidified those plans with um, the client. Um, and yeah, I work from home. I have a home studio. I have a good setup. Um, I bought myself a Cintiq. Um, and that's very lovely. And sometimes um, I do go into the office as well because it's based in Borough. Um, so it's very, I have a fluid uh, life, so I couldn't give you a, sh a single answer to that question, but yeah. And then you spend some time as well uh, tutoring. Tutoring, yes. So I teach um, digital technologies um, to do with animation as well. So, so we will come <laughs> back to you with regard to some of the software and, and the expertise that you have in that area. But I want to go over to, to, to you, Neil, and say that um, how does what you do differ from what we've heard so far? <coughs> Um, well, because I'd say my time is split evenly between running the business and being involved in production. Uh, in the early days, or up to maybe three or four years ago, I used to do a lot of the work myself in, with other people in the studio. And then as we've kind of developed a bit, uh, I guess I've taken a little bit more of a step back from production, a bit like Will, where I work with people and uh, get them to realize what the brief is or what the project is, as opposed to getting my hands dirty myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, day to day, it's it's pretty varied. Uh, depends what's on, what type of project. If it's a big CG project, I'll, I'd say 90% of my time is actually on that project, but not actually doing any animation, just helping all our artists to navigate through the problems that invariably pop up with CG stuff because it's so technical and stuff breaks the whole time so you're constantly putting out little fires uh, and just yeah just guiding people through and uh, because our studio is mainly freelance based you're sort of constantly staying on them so so they know your systems and you're so everybody's in check and everybody's on the right page so um, one thing that I meant to do is, now that we've finished watching the animation, I thought we might pretend that we're all one panel, actually, and move a little bit closer to each other. <laughs> so if you don't mind, we might move in a little bit closer, yes. Because I feel as though I'm... But we wanted, we wanted not to have our heads popping up in the middle of everybody's um, animations.
There's um, nothing that irritates me more than, than having to watch a screen and seeing, you know, four heads in front of it and you can't see everything on the screen. So that's why we did separate off. Uh, can, I come, can I come back to you, Neil, and talk to you about different styles of animation? Do you have a particular style that, that your team uh, works with or are you across the board different types of animation? Uh, no, we're pretty across the board. Um, we started off as CG. Uh, but as I said, we've kind of done everything over the years. Is that me? Um, but uh, so yeah, so we've done. Uh, we were talking earlier about sort of fake stop motion CG rep or stop motion replicated in CG. We've, we're kind of getting a bit of a name for that. Uh, fake paper craft. So it looks like paper stop motion, but it's done in CG, which yeah, which agencies and uh, producers love because you can just go back and iterate change after change and they can really hone down their execution whereas with real stop motion you just got one shot at it and that's it so yeah and and, and so it is much more set in set in stone as it were once yeah if you're so doing they get the flexibility to change that color right up to the day of delivery which they love doing yes of course they do <laughs> because they're the client yeah. <laughs> And in fact, I, w I will uh, talk to you a little bit about how how you deal with, with clients. Uh, but a client comes in and they want you to do a job and th they're therefore commissioning you. How much is that allowing you to offer them your creativity and how much uh, will some of them uh, require it to be their way and no other way? It varies quite a lot. Um, most most companies are quite open to our creativity, and we just ask our prim primary questions are, you know, who are you talking to? What do you want to say? And what do you want them to do? What's the call to action? Um, it's not. It, it is storytelling, but in a different way. Um, and they can normally give us that information. Then we we've got a, a quite a robust briefing um, process. We ask lots and lots of questions. We go and do some desktop research. We look at the competition, their industry, etc. And then we try and come up with something which really pops and stands out for that target audience because it's obviously got to be appropriate and engaging for them. Um, and they may have a, a, a series of audiences. It might not just be one. Um, and from there, we, we then create mood boards um, and uh, a script and a storyboard and all that kind of stuff. And it all gets signed off as we go. Um, and then we get start on the asset creation and the animation um, and all the sort of post-production stuff like the voiceover and the sound effects and music, etc. Yes, and uh, uh, so th so I was just trying to unpick a little bit about the difficulties sometimes that you might... I see you nodding, Ellie. <laughs> the difficulties... I, I think if... Well, we, we stick to brand guidelines if the client has some or we might suggest brand guidelines if they don't. So those are the things we have to kind of stick to. Um, and if there's like a big committee that's making the decisions, then that's when things tend to, um, you know, there's lots of back and forth. But that's why we have sign-off sections. Uh, and and yes. if you want to go back, then it would it would be outside the budget. Otherwise, you'd go on forever. Uh, a little bit of the sort of quasi prints to approach to it. Then the <laughs> Something project like that, management. Yes. yes. Yeah, but uh, it's all it's all upfront. We're very sort of transparent. We say, look, this is the process. You know, if you've gone to stage three and you want to go and change something in stage one, we can do it. But we'll have to relook at the budget. So. Uh, Y yes, yeah. yes. Um, I, I, I did see you smiling and nodding when we were talking about clients and difficulties, Ellie. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think there's like different avenues of difficulty. So when you have something that's got brand guidelines and you're working for um, a company and you're working in a company and they approach you, that pipeline is very established and you can make changes up until a certain point and then there's a commitment. But when, you're, when I'm like freelancing, if I'm going through nerd, I have a wonderful producer who handles all of that and I don't feel the stress. But when I'm like self-managing and I'm freelancing, um, and especially if it's more of a, the client's passion project, I would say, so um, or like something that isn't branded um, and the guidelines aren't as um, solidified, then changes can come and come again, which I don't mind doing as long as there's... Um, like a pre-established stage release of those amendments that can be made um, as well. So, so we're calling this how to get ahead in animation and yeah. I'm hearing one big thing then coming out of this is you have to have the ability to manage clients, to negotiate, to have skills in, in the, uh, you know, not only with 
skills with computers, you have to have skills with real people as well, as being yeah, a project, vital. Project management is pretty important. If yeah. you want to get a, and your ability to quite nicely tell them what they can have and what they can't have, yes? Uh, <laughs> or are you more yeah, straight yeah, away? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, you can be pretty creative around even sort of strict stuff. Um, yeah, yes. It's about, you know, convincing them that your idea is the great idea. Yes, I, I just say so you're, you're nodding well, yes? Um, I quite liked or like working with the client because you kind of get a feel for what they want and then the more you work with them the more you can kind of tailor make what you're doing to keep them happy because you know they pay the bills and stuff and um, uh, there's one project which I came on board for the second series of so it's already established I came in as animation director and I had my ideas and um, we delivered a couple of episodes and the client sat me down in a meeting room and was like right what, what are you trying to do I don't like it and I was like no no it's fine it'll be fine like this is what we're going to do, and if you trust me, it'll be great. And then um, 20 episodes later, he sort of turned around and was like, yeah, it was your right to do what you were doing and thanked me for what I was doing. But it's because I was listening to what he was saying week on, week on, week on, and sort of improving what he was saying, and to the point where it was this, just no real issue. But it took a long time to get that trust built up. But don't you think as well it's a lot to do with confidence? Because if you've got confidence in your skills uh, and your company skills, yeah. it comes across and the client tends to but use yeah, you. It you're the, is you're the, trust. the expert, yeah. so... Yeah, and uh, if, if the client does allow you with their brand as well, that's also quite a nice feeling, but you still have to earn that trust to get it. So, Neil, when people come into the industry, um, they might have come from university or they might have come through an apprenticeship, and we'll talk about that later. Um, do people come in prepared for this sort of relationship with clients, etc., or are they coming in very well? I'm really good at this particular software, and I do quite good graphic design, you know, and so I'm great. Uh, <coughs> no, they're usually coming in pretty focused on one particular skill set, like animation or technical stuff, or lighting and rendering, or whatever in the pipeline. Um, so usually, usually artists won't really have to deal with the management issues like that, and, and it's the it's maybe next level up mm. in the company that should really shield everybody from that and just let the artists get on with what they're good at. So, but if you want to get ahead, you're going to have to have those skills, yes? Yeah, well, I, I'd imagine our studio is pretty small. Uh, maybe in Blue Zoo, you're dealing with so many people uh, across the board that as you become more senior you're naturally going to pick up those skills uh, so I would I would imagine that you just kind of slowly build it up and get to it yeah I think it, it, when you first start off you're kind of in a in a small team and then that small team is in a bigger team and then that bigger team is in a big team so you sort of learn to work and communicate with the people around you and that's how you sort of get ahead is by communicating with your peers and the artists you work with. And then also because some, not straight away, but like you have to communicate with other people across departments. So you will come across other people and it's a, you can kind of call it a client if you're talking to a rigger as well. Because yeah. you, know, you have to kind of treat them differently. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's it doesn't start off that way, but it's a good way for an entry level to sort of develop those skills in your smaller team and then diversify to your bigger team that way. So, w so Ali, when you came in to the industry, having like, uh, left what university? You didn't tell us, did you? Pardon? What university were you at? UCA. Oh, UCA. Yes. Okay, so when you left UCA, and I'm not asking you to criticise their course or anything like that, but did you feel prepared for the outside world when you... When oh, that's a good question. I firstly had a lot of momentum when i graduated i'd done my random acts film in third year which was um rostrum camera so although i had this very honed set of skills it's very difficult to find <laughs> that kind of job um in the industry so um what happened with me is i got picked up quite immediately as a director um, at nerd and i had some commercials and stuff but what happened is i got quite a lot of clout but over that time the skills that I had at uni kind of I didn't use them and I'm not afraid to admit I did lose them um, so what I did uh, this year is I, um, so I went back and did an internship at a studio ah. um, and just kind of 
you know that's one way of getting ahead i think yeah showing you still want to go back and do your skills and yeah i went for that bottom rung that i completely stepped over um when i left uni and i would have loved to have stayed and worked my way up um but was not meant to be um but i wouldn't turn down another role like that at all i think it was i learned so much um in that role yeah actually just jumping in there I was chatting with a friend a couple of weeks ago who's a character animator at MPC on some of their films and stuff. And <coughs> he was saying that uh, a lot of the anim they've got some young animators in MPC now who are just straight out of uni and they're, they're really good, but they can't do anything else. And the way he got into the business was uh, in much smaller studios where you're forced to do a little bit of everything and you just get a really good foundation across the board of every step of the process. And then as he's got more senior and more senior, he's kind of specialized, but his skill set is much broader than just animation and it's really helped him out in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and probably the case in, in, in your type of company that people end up having a broader range of skills, would that be correct? Uh, absolutely. Mo most of our animators are quite general. Uh, they can do a whole stack of different types of animations. But you mentioned about being uh, work ready. Uh, we had a, an intern from France, from one of the French universities, uh, and you, we all know how, how good they are. Um, and she was so work ready uh, that it was really quite you know, obvious. Um, just the skills that they, they train them up on. It's one of the things that I mentioned at the, uh, the apprenticeship uh, board that was on, um, is that quite often, animators come out into commerce and they do a lot of hand-drawn animation, but we don't use any hand-drawn animation or hardly ever. We use vector animation. So if you don't have that as part of a portfolio or don't attempt to try and learn some of that before you come and see us anyway, we can't take you on. So it's interesting to see how other universities, how other countries actually get their, um, you know, their guys commercially ready as well as skills ready. Yes, so that they can walk in with the skills that you require and... Having an idea of what a studio is like and, and what, what roles are within a studio and what's required and things like, like deadlines. Um, at university, you've got such longer deadlines um, and you do something in a term. In our office, you do something in a day or a week if you're lucky, so... Yeah, well, that, that is true. The, the concept of a flexible deadline, I mean, my, my background's in live telly, so we don't know what a flexible deadline is. You either go on air or you get black screen. But um, the, uh, I have noticed, that working with some animators, that they just so want to get it right that I'm, you know, I'm ringing them up almost every day saying, is it ready yet, you know? Well, it's their love of getting something perfect. But yeah. sometimes you don't have the luxury of getting it perfect. You've just got to get it good enough to yeah. get it out uh, on the deadline. Yes. So uh, uh, deadlines, I see you nodding, uh, Will. Yeah, so uh, we have to deliver an episode every week and we're doing 52 episodes. So that's a year-long project. And at one point, we're, well, we are running for... We're a animating four episodes a week but offset so it's, it's a weird way of doing it but um deadlines sometimes things happen and you just don't hit a deadline and that's when this flexible thing comes in it's like someone could just be ill for a day like you can't help that or someone's child has a day off sick yeah can't come to work so you have to have this flexibility and understanding that you do just have to kind of let things go because things get in the way uh, it's not you don't want to do it but like you, you or at the same time you can't force someone to work late to do stuff well and also i would imagine that there if on particular animations there are p people who as it were know the characters and know the animations you can't just can you pull someone else off somewhere else and say do that day's work uh, on some shows we can but the show that i'm working on now it, we, what we've n what we noticed was that it took an animator four or five months to get used to the style of animation and to understand the character and to really nail the performance. And that was one of the longest sort of uh, learning curves that we've ever found on a project. So could you go through some details about what that learning is? Understanding the character, nailing the performance, uh, five yeah. months to understand yeah. how it works. Um, is that, that's not just understanding the software, is it? It's no, it's, it's, to do it's, with it's the show. It's, it's knowing what um, the characters are thinking, the motivations, the style of animation, how one character would react with another character. Normally, the, the general rule is three episodes under your belt. You know what you're doing. But um, 
uh, an episode is generally three weeks long, but on the current project, an episode is four weeks long. So already that's three months in before you understand what you're doing. Um, so we, we, we kind of ran sort of a bit of an induction as well, sort of like a boot camp to, to sort of try to get the animators up to speed. Uh, but this was, I think this is just a one-off project at Blue Zoo as well, where it is this learning longer learning curve. Can you talk about what the project is, or is it top uh, secret? If the cameras aren't on, maybe. I don't. <laughs> 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 I'm not, I think we can, but I just want to play, play it safe. Whis <laughs> maybe not. Whispers. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you could mime it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but all the other shows that were done, such like Go Jetters, Number Blocks, True Food Tom, Cuputer Five, a an animator can easily just jump off another show and onto that one really comfortably because we, Blues, you yes. do have a, a a general style of animation. It's just this one new show, which is a, a little bit different, quite different. Yeah, yeah. and is it, a, um, is it a children's show? Or yes, you can it's tell a preschool children's show. A preschool children's yeah. show, okay. So, and it's got animal creatures in it. Maybe. Yes. Yes, <laughs> all right then. So we know a little bit just about just it. Just Google it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Google Blue <t> <laughs> Bluetooth. Blue, uh, Blue Zoo. Zoo. <laughs> New show. <laughs> yeah. About a pair. Okay, so we're starting to build a set of skills that will allow you to move ahead in the animation industry and get a bit of a feel of some of the, the difficulties behind it. We've talked about the fact that you, um, you should have some, uh, the ability, social skills, the ability to negotiate, the, the ability to listen but be heard. I heard that one actually, that, that you know, to have that confidence that you want to be heard. Um, deadlines. Any more things that you'd like to add to that, Neil? I mean, if you've got somebody new coming in the door and they're really good, you'll be saying they're really good because... Oh. Um, well, I'd say our studio is so small and we have a kind of unique sense of humour. A, a lot of our work <laughs> is quite fun. Um, yeah. And the atmosphere in the studio is quite irreverent and nobody really holds back anything. So a good personality to fit with that is pretty key for us. Um, so team, the ability to be a team player and to, and to muck in, yes? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, it's, yeah. I think, like I just said, our the atmosphere in our offices, there's a lot of... Is it the whole humorous banter going on? Yeah, Ban yeah. Banter is one of those words that we're not quite sure of nowadays. So, <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, for us, uh, especially if it's a long project and we're going to have somebody in the studio for quite a while, they yeah. they have to fit in. So, I mean, quite often now we've we've found a regular batch of people that we go back to because we know they just work and yeah, uh, yeah it's just handy because you know their skill set and you know how fast they work and you can sort of just piece together the project in your head if they were on it, you know, safe pair of hands. Yeah. It's true, you, you really have to have a team that sort of gels together. We, we had a couple of animators that got stuck on, on their own, each of their own projects, and they decided to swap projects, um, and, and they just carried on, and they became unstuck and found something new and, and carried on, and that was just off their own bat, they decided to do that. So it's about having that sort of collegiate um, entente, I suppose, and, and understanding and kind of shared sense of humour definitely helps. And and being project based, I think, must be great fun as well. If you're all, if, if there's a number of you working in, in a in a team like that, um, I'm I was going to come back to you, Christine, because you said you, it you implied that you had sort of more recently got into this animation business and that you had come from somewhere else beforehand. Was that yeah, right? So I, I've been in marketing for many years, oh, uh, marketing, PR, all sorts of different ways of communicating, but I just love animation. I just think it's such a powerful tool. We're all very busy, we're all you know, time poor, we have a lot to um, absorb, and I think animation, particularly for commercial use, is a fantastic way to absorb it. You can watch it on your phone, you can watch it with sound without sound, you can watch it in a, in a you know, conference situation, um, on your website, on email signatures, it's, it's so versatile, um, and you can say so much in such a little amount of time. I mean, our sort of 60 second animations, uh, we can only use between 50 and 90 words, which is a really small amount of words, but you can actually convey a lot. In fact, Forrester's reckons that a 60 second video animation is equivalent to 1.8 million words, because if you had to describe everything in it, so the sound, the music, the colours, the environment, the characters, the what they're doing, etc., etc., etc. So it's incredibly powerful. 
And, and uh, you are getting messages across. Uh, with your marketing background, that must be one of the things that you actually excel in. And so you it's decided... It's huge fun. It's huge fun. So, so having been in marketing, you then decided to move in and do these things for yourself then? Yes, I just saw that there was definitely a need for it. Um, and I, I just love the way it works and how, you know, you can build something out of nothing. Um, and you can be very abstract or you can be very precise. Um, there's just so many different ways to getting your story across. And I really believe that when you're talking to business, it's, you're still talking to people, but you're still telling stories. It's just finding a new way of doing it. Okay, so um, you're talking business. Uh, shall we start to talk a little bit about money? And, uh, you know, you go online and you say, oh, it's a great business to be involved in. You're going to earn trillions of pounds being an animator, you know. Um, do you think people are coming in expecting to be earning the big time? Or is this, shall we just put that one to bed and say, let's be sensible folks? Uh, or are there certain types of software where people seem to earn more than they should? Or... Um, Come on, let, let's, let's um, just discuss a little it depends, bit about I, money. I imagine it depends on the studios and, and sort of how many people you've got and what kind of budgets you have. Uh, we're not in the same league as Blue Zoo. I mean, you guys are in the big league. Um, and, I mean, you know, we, we pay fairly. Um, they'd probably earn more in London, but then you'd have to pay to get into London. So well, that's Oh, yes, because you're based in, in well, Windsor. Eaton, Eaton oh, and Dundee, yeah. Yeah, Eaton. And Dundee, yes. And Dundee's <laughs> great, by the way. It's incredible. It's a very exciting city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th they've got a very nice Malmaison there, I uh, understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the gaming mecca, I think. Um, most uh, Scot uh, uh, American people know of Dundee before they know Edinburgh because of the gaming. Oh, Who knew? Th th there's a lot of, of, of gaming uh, animators there. That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, when, when, you, when, when you're talking about a bigger company, um, you are able to, you have sort of set rates of pay as you go up the, the ladder, is that it? You're, you're yeah. And set rates for your freelancers and that's sort of take it or leave it? Yeah. Or, or so I come from more of the production side of things, which yeah. is the long format TV series. Is series is and um we have a commercials department on our first floor which is more freelance based uh <laughs> where they have smaller turnaround projects and that's where they do yeah tend to get the freelancers into that there are um permanent staff there as well who are uh differently paid i guess to the um production staff because they're permanent i've been fixed permanently contracted for nine years now. So I'm, I'm not a permanent member of staff, but I've always got a contract onto the next project sort of thing. So it's a project by project basis. And then, um, so yeah, I think, you know, the graduate junior salary is different to when you go to an animator and then there's a different salary onto a senior and onto a lead and then you sort of go up that way. Yeah, and they're pretty, s would you say they're pretty industry standard, those types of salaries? Um, because it's TV, it's slightly different to, say, a big VFX film company. Of course, yes. Um, so TV uh, salaries are a little bit less because of the budget that they have and sort of uh, a production with a bigger budget are able to spend more money. So there is a difference there. But um, no, it's still healthy. I managed to buy a flat, so <laughs> here you go. Yeah, fine. <laughs> and, and, and fairly near to London. Uh, Surrey border. <laughs> 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 so that that's good. So we have been um, talking about, uh, as it were, uh, sharing information through anim animation. We talk about character-based animation for for television. We haven't really talked that much about gaming. Um, huge Chinese companies involved in gaming, and obviously Sony was a huge company that. I, I was looking it up. I think they started in the in the early nineties, did they not? With the who 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 knew knew when that PlayStation started? <laughs> Are any of you gamers? Dabble. I don't do a Form, lot. Formerly. Not really. I'm afraid. No, 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 no. Um, but but we do know that the gaming side of things is another venue for the animator to go up yeah, upon starting. Quite a lucrative industry. one, actually. I'd say. And that might be more more lucrative. You yeah, think there's, a, there's a lot of money in gaming. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of jobs. A lot of jobs. A lot of jobs for animators in games, maybe more than in animation. And and uh, would you say that then we heard in the past it was mainly of one gender? Is that changing now? Do you know? Oh, look at the room already. I guess. I mean, in gaming. Oh, in gaming. Yeah. yeah. No, I think yeah, I think it is changing actually. In 
the whole industry actually because um, when I was at starting at university 12 years ago it, it was 90% male 10% female and now that again just this room as well it's very nicely balanced I have to say and even when I go back to universities and have a look around what's going on there even there it's it's lovely and split uh, and I think what it is is because um, the industry now is seemingly turning to be more artistic rather than like being more technical and more software based being an artist or being an animator being a game designer is now an art and, and that's more appealing and to more is that because the the software is just getting better and more user friendly and better front end etc yeah, I guess so yeah and I think it just is also because of the sort of the, the design of the game and the design of sets in games and I guess you can say the whole VFX industry the TV industry everything it's just it, it is the, the art aspect to it um, you are involved in an organisation that promotes <laughs> diversity, are you not? Yes. Um, so there's a uh, organisation called Access VFX, which is just up there, um, which is aiming at trying to diversify the industry at a sort of grassroots level. So we go to high schools, go to colleges, and we do talks and we do activities and we speak to students who necessarily might not come from the backgrounds which will be able to go into the industry, but that's who we're targeting and trying to diversify out um, this industry. Um, and in the summer, we ran some summer schools which invited children to come and actually uh, animate on Blender. And um, they also did a bit of stop motion. We also had a guy from Pixar do a talk, I think. There's a nod. That's good. So um, we are actually you know, trying to really reach out and across the country as well. So I am going to Norwich on Friday to talk to some th people there. There's an event on in there. Um, and I know uh, there's some other stuff across the country as well. Uh, and that's what I'm a part of. Um, here's just a little sideways question. Um, do you think the fact that um, youngsters have access to PowerPoint and they animate in PowerPoint is actually making them realize that they could do something like that? Or is that just a poor man's version of it all? You just described my origin story. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah, if you enjoy making move images move, you'll find a way to do it. Whether I think if I said Nintendo DS Picto Chat, is yep. anybody? Yeah, some people were nodding. Some people know what I'm talking about. So that was the first kind of animation that I ever did, and yeah, it kind of went from there. And was that from quite a young age? Oh yeah, like I'd say ten or under. Oh really? And and you were going to? Uh, say? Uh, I was just going to say I did a whole presentation recently uh, in PowerPoint, uh, just using the animation tools just for fun to see what could be done. And a lot can be done, can't it? Yeah. <laughs> varying quality, but you know, <laughs> it can still move. It's just my granddaughter managed to get a dog by doing a complete animation of, of uh, dogs in PowerPoint. Um, I say she managed to get it, it doesn't sound, she didn't get it quickly. It took her five years of different animations in PowerPoints on a regular basis. But then the end, her parents were so, so impressed with the quality well, of it. Well, it worked. <laughs> and um, uh, unfortunately, she hasn't. She hasn't touched it since because she got her, <laughs> she got her dog. But but I think I think the ability of a nine year old, you know, a nine and ten year old, to be able to experience animation in a way that people of my generation couldn't, except to flip the corners of a book, you know, which is what we used to do is just draw pictures on the side. Um, I think that must be getting a broader range of people into animation. Do you think? No, you're well, not. You're none of you are saying yes. <laughs> there are a lot more tutorials online. Uh, for example, we, we use Blender um, at, in the studio, and there's lots of tutorials on that, and it's getting increasingly better. And you were saying, well, that a lot of the big studios won't admit to the fact they actually use it too. But, uh, <laughs> really? but it's amazing. And I mean, it's being used in big uh, major movies as well. So it's, it's getting better and better and better. And you can actually start off on that. In fact, we have um, a work experience um, youngsters from schools who come and spend a few days with us, and we get them to do um, the famous uh, blender donut, um, and they, they can't believe that they can actually do it after a few days, and they've done one. It's really Bl cool. It's very addictive. Blender is free, by the way. That's why we're talking about it. Yes. So, um, and it's just downloadable. Yeah. And a, re a, a quite a friendly front end. Uh, what the the blender. software? Yeah. Uh, I haven't actually used it, but I th I think the the, the 
it's exactly the same as what the industry is using, and um, I think there are there are a lot of tutorials it's, it's online. It's getting better as well, and, yeah. and they've got a, a front end that, that that's, uh, sort of emulates Maya as well. So if you're used to using Maya, you can sort of put it on that yeah, format. You can and switch over the UIs, yeah. can't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so can I just add that um, everyone also has the ability to do stop motion with a phone. So I think with the kids now who are doing like uh, those Lego animations and then yes. getting an app, I think Lego actually now have an app to do their own Lego stop motions. And because you know, you, you give a kid an iPad, there you go. So th that's the more novel route into it. And we've had a lot of kids come to the studio who have shown us their Lego animations. Oh, that's what we do. Uh, yeah. and, that, and they yeah. sort of come in and see what we do. In a, uh, and of course, Lego the, Lego the movie is inspiring to do that, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> who, would have th who would have thought th that Lego would, would turn into movies? I, s I certainly wouldn't. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Um, you were going to talk us a little bit about the apprenticeship program that you have been yeah, involved so in um, creating. I was asked to join a sort of a, a board of um, various companies, including Blue Zoo, actually, uh, to put together the sort of levels and skills required for level four and level seven for the animation apprenticeship. Um, and uh, it was really cool. Uh, my sort of uh, contribution was to really talk about the fact that we need vector <laughs> trained youngsters uh, and not just hand-drawn. I mean, the hand-drawn stuff's amazing and it's beautiful, but commercially, it's less um, common that you can use it because of the fact you can't go back and change it when the client wants a different color, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that was a really cool thing to be part of and I'm really glad that, that it's being sort of brought to the fore and, and made possible for youngsters to do that. Good, and, and that, was, was that, that was how you were trained then as you came through? Um, so I didn't get taught any illustrator or vector-based programs at uni, but I now teach it. So Whoa. there is definitely a supply and demand thing when it comes to the industry. So f another thing that happens is, you know, s especially in animation, software develops so fast, it goes out of date pretty quick. Um, a little sob story I like to tell is I w learned soft image and um <laughs> by the time I reached my third year, soft image had been discontinued. It was an Autodesk software for those of you who have never heard it. Um, so then the industry moved to Maya and I, uh, I got left behind. So if I could give advice about learning software, um, it's not learning how to use software, it's learning how you learned to use the software so you can transfer those skills um, around, uh, if that makes sense. Well, oh, well, this whole idea of the fact that people work on different types of animation, that keeps that flexibility in the mind, doesn't it? Because if you get very specialised in one type of software and then they stop supporting it or it just goes belly up, then you are in trouble. How did you recover from that one then? Well, luckily I was going down the 2D pathway anyway, but, you know, who knows if stuff, soft and marsh hadn't have gone out of... Um, uh, circulation, I might have gone that way, but um, I guess I, with the sp specifically the vector stuff, I that's how why I went back into the internship and went and got studio experience because um, trying to learn while freelancing and also teaching and everything else I was juggling, um, I just needed practical application um, to learn. That's the way I like to. Uh, I don't really learn from watching tutorials. I'm I find it quite easier to do. Just to get on with it. Yeah. So, Neil, are there a variety of different softwares used in, in w amongst your colleagues then? <coughs> yeah, it's pretty uh, it's hugely varied. In fact, we, we are still a soft image studio, uh, hanging on one of the last few studios, I think, using it. But we recently uh, got given a project that was in Maya, so we switched over to Maya for that project. Uh, and then again, we just finished a project in Cinema 4D, and that's all 3D stuff. Uh, and then when it comes to 2D, it's just whatever the artist wants to use, really. Um, so Flash, or what's it called now? Anima animator? Animate. Animate. Uh, Toon Boom, TV Paint. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we're pretty flexible, and they all do sort of short-term subscription stuff, so it's pretty easy to, s to switch around. And I, I think this is another one of the skills then that we've got to put up on our list. Um, I'm not like, <laughs> I did go to an event once which was uh, something about how women get ahead in something. And um, I th we all came up with lots of ideas. And then the guy running it flipped his flip chart and said, this is what we've learned. 
he'd pre-written a flip chart, and 50% of what we said wasn't on it at all. Um, so I haven't pre-prepared a slide full of key things to uh, take on board as you're wanting to get ahead. But we have said, teamwork, we have said the ability to communicate with clients and the rest of the people in the organization. You are saying the ability to keep learning and to uh, understand that you mustn't get down one little alleyway and stay there. The eggs in one basket. Yeah, yeah the eggs in... And stay curious, yeah. And, and stay curious. Yeah, yes, I mean, that, that's it, to keep that creativity alive, haven't we said? Uh, and um, so, so the concept of being business ready or work ready, uh, which you talked about, Christine, as well, is um, is something I think more and more universities are starting to talk about. Uh, from the other perspective, they want you to create, uh, be creative artists. So they don't. Many universities don't want you to be ready for business. We're not here to train. Um, we are here to allow you to explore your art, art artistry. Um, but I think it, it's. We, we live in an environment now where you actually have to have useful skills as you walk out the door, don't you? Mm. Uh, Definitely. Yes. So, so um, <coughs> that, that approach of the past, which was to allow full creativity and uh, you can do whatever you want and we're not going to actually address what will happen after you leave us, I think is that, I think that is starting to, to go. From your perspective, they're obviously taking it on board because you're now teaching it. Aren't you? You're now addressing that at yes at the UCA. Yes. Um, but when when you were doing your, you said you left with a masters. Were you, were you were you ready? I don't still think I'm ready. So <laughs> I'm still blagging every day. Um, it, what the university I went to, they encouraged net uh, the artists or the students to go to networking events. So. I guess something like this. So already you're trying to get one step ahead by a attending something like this, which is quite good. Um, they, my university also encouraged artists to reach out to studios to do studio visits. So then you're actually interacting with industry and actually talking to them. Um, uh, and we made short films as well. I, I don't know if you did the same thing. But also when you're working in a small team at university, you're learning these soft skills there at the time, which then hopefully will be transferable when you get into the workplace. Um, so th yeah, that's... I, I agree. I think teamwork is really important. And if you've done s a collaborative thing at university, it shows um, lots of skills that can be used commercially. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. Well, we've, we've enjoyed ourselves and had a, had a long chat, but I want to be able to throw it open now to the audience. Um, we've got a good, a, a broad selection of people with, with varying backgrounds here. And um, I know that we probably have a number of people who would like to ask questions. So I'm just going to come in amongst you with my microphone. Or I, I'm not sure if we have a separate one, but oh, we've got a separate one. David's got one. Good. <coughs> OK, so can I ask, see if there's anybody who'd like to ask a question of the panel? Uh, okay, over there, Rosemary. Uh, how do you, this is a bit cheeky, how do you get your work, how do you get your projects? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> is that anyone in particular? Uh, all of you, I think. Up there, is that uh, networking, um, reaching out, cold calling, campaigns, um, Speaking events. Uh, pitch for ideas. So some clients put ideas out for tender and then you pitch for them and you have to compete against other companies to get them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, um, sort of if, if, so that the, on my showreel, that was um, from a, uh, a small mini series which was in a, done in America. So you guys will never have seen that. No one will ever see it because it's in America. And they saw a small short which Blue Zoo did. They liked it, and then they wanted them to do their little TV series. So it's publicity is another way. Cool. And coming from the perspective of a freelance, maybe early career animator, it is putting your work out there. It is putting yourself out there, um, making your face known, going to social events as much as you might not want to, um, and just applying for stuff and pitching stuff, even if you might feel out of your depth, 
Um, I think if you show that you are ballsy enough to be applying for something um, that you you might not, you know, if you're the other people that are applying might be like Blue Zoo or someone else, then someone might and will eventually take a chance on you. Yeah, and put yourself out on uh, social media as well. Put your work out there and share it and get into forums and, and, and pitch your work. And we've had people approach us who, you know, want to work with us. And sometimes we take them on and sometimes we don't. But it's at least we know of them. Uh, and I've actually forwarded uh, really talented people onto other studios because we can't take them on. But, you know, if you've got good work, then people will want to, to see you. I'd, <coughs> I'd say Instagram is probably the single most important tool for an animator looking for work because quite often showreels are really polished clips and th you're only seeing like really polished work from the, from the animator, but if they do loads of tests which, which don't necessarily look good for a showreel, but they're giving you an insight into how they're thinking and how they're approaching work, it's, it's like a second reel, but it's a more true reel about their inner animator. Mm -hmm. and can I build on that as well? Um, the work that you're putting out there, if you want to keep doing more work like that, then put work like that out because that will attract a similar style. Um, I kind of got myself into a rut by accident where I did a sports job like for a football team and then I put that out there and then I got another job based off of it and then another job and then suddenly all I was doing was football team. Uh, I, don't, I don't watch football. <laughs> I don't think I ever have. Um, but suddenly I was in this weird laddie sports world and that was all the jobs I was getting. So you put your own personal work out there um, to like, f you know, it's bait and fish. Yeah. And and um, because you're you're starting an industry, is it fair for you to be putting out stuff that you've done for yourself, apart from being for particular clients? I mean, do you do stuff for your own amusement and put that out? Um, I'd like to say yes, but um, the true answer to that is not right now, not for a little while. I've been really busy, um, and a lot of the projects that I have been working on, um, like with the studio, have been either under wraps. Um, some of the projects that I do through Nerd are for internal circulation, so ne have never seen the light of day. So I have a whole catalogue of work that I just can't really share. Um, but when I'm, um, like, if a commissioner approaches me or if I'm applying for something that I think my style fits that brief, I'll send a, like, a watermark link that they can't download to be like, this is why I think I can do this. Okay. Now, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So pitching an uh, original idea. Yeah, Well, d does does stuff get fully funded? It, That's it, a bottom line it question. It does, yeah, but it takes a lot of time to get the funding for it. Um, Blue Zoo now have a des dedicated um, team trying to get their IP out there and get the funding and well to get the show off the ground. Um, for example, uh, Digby Dragon, which we've done two series of now, I think it took five years to from initial idea to actually start doing something. So it is a long, hard process to get it. Um, but let's not discourage anyone from doing it because it's very <laughs> rewarding if you do get your own show made. Um, but it is a very long process. Mm -hmm. I would say <coughs> find somebody yeah, yeah. who knows the business and specialises in that kind of thing and team up with them because as with a lot of business, it's all about who you know and if you can take a shortcut to the top to the decision makers, it's going to be easier. Can I tell a quick story? So in July, um, I, well, back in January, I got a seed fund to develop a kids show IP that I had. And in July, I volunteered at the children's media conference, which is all about um, industry people in the children's TV world meet up and they talk about children's TV. So I went in there as a in my volunteer's t-shirt with my treatment uh, un <laughs> under my arm. And I met the broadcaster of um, the commissioning broadcast for the BBC and I showed her 
and I don't know what I was expecting to happen. Like she'd be like, oh, <laughs> let's make it. Um, nothing happened, nothing went anywhere, but I think um, there's a unconventional avenue uh, to answer your question. Um, yeah. um, apparently the BBC only fund 18% of a project if they like it, and they, they want to see uh, a script before they see any animation, and that's what they approve. So. It's uh, hard yards. I did it um, wrong. <laughs> certainly in, in TV program making, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know about how that works for children's animation, but they, t they always tell you to go through a producer or a production company that they know well already, mm -hmm. because um, if they don't know you already, they're less likely to give weight to your opinions, be they very good. Um, they liked, I mean, unfortunate, and I would say it's a bit unfortunate at the moment with, with commissioners, they know what they like and they like what they know, you know. So uh, going through a company that exists already might be the best way for you. Okay. Um, I've been asked to use this mic if there's more questions. So, okay, I'm just going to bring it to you, okay? Thank you. Yeah, no way. <laughs> I know I can't. All right, quick question for all four of you. What form of animation do you think is the most used in the creative industry at the moment to this day? Because I've kind of noticed how Disney doesn't really do light box animation a lot now. It breaks my heart. Yeah. Uh, I'd say we're more in the commercials world than maybe Will uh, and you guys, perhaps. Yeah, I, I feel like that the answer to that question breaks into 2D and 3D. Yeah, 2D yeah. has really come back lately. Um, but then what's also happening now is people are just really blurring the lines between everything, so you can't really put anything in a box anymore. Um, one, of one job we did recently had puppeteered little bits of soaring, you know, that cake, and then we animated faces and limbs on top of the puppeteered stuff. Uh, and then we did a latimation where we got the UK champion of latte art and he did we we gave him every frame that we wanted and he made hundreds of cups of coffee all with the animation in the coffee and we photographed it all so i don't know where that fits in <laughs> to the <laughs> to your question but it's just like i think i think the trend is like it used to be there's 2D animation, there's 3D animation, there's stop motion animation. Now it's like, it's just all blurred. Yeah, I agree. It is much more sort of mixed up. Yeah. I mean, Blended. that's what, particularly in the advertising world, people are looking for a visual hook that's different, that hasn't been seen before to make their product or service stands out, stand out. And so I think that's part of the reason why we've ended up in this complete blurry animation discipline field. Agreed. Uh, any more questions from? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just going to run round to you. Okay. So, a question for all four of you again. So, from the perspective of someone that's about to graduate and doesn't have that much like commissioned work, and you know, like. Um, actual work stuff for like their showreel. What do you look for in in a showreel for like that's going to stand out to you above all the others? Like what sort of stuff are you? G it might be different for your different studios, and that'd be interesting to know if I, you know, what you'd actually look for in someone that was applying to you to work for you, if that makes sense. Uh, so good are you, good are you question. A graduate? Are you? Are you? Where are you? In I'm your career. I'm a third year and I'm about to graduate. Brilliant. <laughs> cool. Uh, so whenever I am recruiting, the first thing I look for is um, body mechanics in a, in a showreel. So that's whether uh, you can move a character correctly, get them to settle, get them to just look natural and organic. Um, weight as well is also important. Um, so any sort of pantomime acting is good to have in a showreel. Uh, and then, as for especially for sort of a... a a graduate, that's the sort of benchmark, that's the thing I look for. And if there's good enough examples of that, then acting on top of that is, is a bonus. But um, I'm under the belief that any good um, supervisor, any good animation director, any good lead will be able to get any animator to act. It's just trying to teach 
body mechanics on a live project takes time and a lot of effort on that uh, on the supervisor. But uh, acting is, is, is some, it's yeah fairly easy to sort of coach. But um, body mechanics is is the main one for me at, for a graduate. If there's any uh, I don't know, seniors, mids, leads, or whatever, then it completely changes, and then we go into more specifics, but that's the main one. Neil, what about you? What do you look for if someone comes to you with a showreel? Um, <coughs> I guess it kind of depends on the job. Sometimes we need them to be a good uh, coffee art person <laughs> in, in that particular instance. Um, but yeah, it's just an understand, pr pretty much iterating what Will just said, understanding weight and uh, I've got a few little personal bugbears about like post pose animation. You can see just a character kind of holding when it should still be alive a little bit. And quite often you see uh, people straight out of uni just falling into that trap. Um, but yeah, just natural. Uh, comic timing actually is one thing. Oddly, I always thought like if you were an animator, you could kind of animate almost anything reasonably well. But because a lot of our work has really specific, fine-tuned comedy timing elements to it, we found that some animators just don't get it. And um, we have to get in people who, who just really hit the beat of the gag perfectly. Um, so I don't know how you teach yourself that. I think people just have it or they don't. It's an extra skill above being a good animator. Um, yeah, that, that's very useful. Now, if someone shows you a show reel, Ellie, what impresses you? Um, I think I judge it more on that individual's work. So, um, what did they set out to do when they did that piece of animation, and how well did they execute it? So it's quite hard to judge. You know, yeah, it's fine if it's character animation but if it's something like non-narrative or a bit more experimental um then that would be how i would judge it um and also the person so their enthusiasm uh, the fact that they've reached out <laughs> to me at all because i don't really employ anyone um <laughs> so that would impress me um but yeah i think because i obviously work with people who are about to graduate and um give them just my thoughts on their showreel and their business cards or whatever and their little platform before they fly the nest. Um, just indiv individuality. Um, but, you know, that ranges from person to person, what kind of job you want to apply for. I think um, just kind of if you have a visual identity, hone it and really own it. Uh, Christine, have you had a showreel shown you where you went, oh my goodness, that has impressed me? Uh, yes, we, we've had a, a few actually. And, and some, like for example, one chap uh, showed us his showreel and he did a really lovely piece with a, a lovely storyline and really nice characters. Um, and he'd work in collaboration with a bunch of other students at the university. And we'd love to take him on, but not yet, because guess what, it's all hand-drawn. Um, but uh, he's got the right skills in other areas. Um, so we have said, look, you know, consider us down the line, go and get some experience or try out doing some um, other styles. But we, we look for variety because we're a small studio. We, we do, uh, you know, we kind of swap hats quite a lot. So we look for variety, we look for good storytelling. We also look for humor, because I think humor is pretty important. Um, even if we're doing a, a corporate animation for a finance company, for example, we always still manage to get a little bit of humor, even if it's in the sound effect, because the end of the day, we're you know we're all human and we, we like laughing, so um, it kind of makes sense. But uh, yeah, and, and also showing that you've worked together with with others is great because that's what you have to do at our studio. So that would be important for us. Now that's a really helpful, good question. Well done. I think as asking good questions is also mm -hmm. a sign that you will be yeah, going curiosity, far. isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right, we have we have an opportunity for one last quick question. Okay, I'm coming to you. Um, my question is for you. Um, before you talked about the process of learning um, and how to develop that across different softwares, mm -hmm. well, my question is, what was your process of learning? My process of learning. Ah, that's interesting. Because I have also just done um, a postgrad certificate in creative education 
and looking at like different ways of learning. Um, and I think my way is doing. I learn through doing, sitting down and just kind of letting the magic happen and not being scared of software. I think most of my time as a student was fear of failure, um, preventing me from even trying to s start. Because what if it didn't look nice? What if it didn't go well? What if it didn't go my way? Um, and I think it lo loops back to what we were talking about earlier about perfectionism. Yes. Um, once I was like, you know what? I'm an anti-perfectionist. I don't want any of my work to ever be perfect and it never will be. Um, and that allowed me to kind of let go and just learn a bit better. I don't think anyone learns one single way. Um, and I think working at a creative arts university has really showed me that and I love that environment as well. I love that way as a way to end. I'm an anti-perfectionist because of not doing it for fear of not getting it right. I think that is a, a wonderful piece of advice to give people. I want to say thank you to our great panel and the honesty with which they answered all your questions. Uh, so will you help me uh, say thank you to them? Thank you very much.